out in the desolate backcountry of southwestern Idaho lies one of the coolest and strangest locomotives you've likely never seen. It has no name, no reporting marks, and no number. It was operated in secret by the U.S. government for roughly 30 years and is perhaps one of the most specialized rail vehicles ever made, with several design features straight out of a sci-fi movie. But why does this thing exist in the first place? What could it have possibly hauled that called for such a peculiar design? And what's it doing out in the middle of nowhere? This unnamed machine was built by General Electric in 1954, during the height of the atomic age and the start of the Cold War. It served one facility and one facility only its entire working life, the Idaho National Laboratory, or INL for short. Some of you may recognize this name. After all, this lab was the first to produce a nuclear reactor capable of generating electricity, as well as the first to produce the nuclear power plants found in submarines and large watercraft. This engine's original purpose was to move experimental nuclear jet engines around the compound. During this time in the Cold War, both the U.S. and the USSR were developing nuclear-powered aircraft, so naturally, we had to beat them to it. But once the government moved on from these ventures, the locomotive was left to haul all manner of top-secret experimental equipment produced at INL. The way in which Idaho National Laboratory's critical cargo had to be transported was just as bizarre as this engine. Instead of using tracks with two rails, all six branch lines at this compound had four rails. The engine rode on the middle two and usually hauled a single double wide flat car with no less than four trucks, which rode on all the rails. Not only did this double wide design make the flat cars extremely stable, it also gave INL the ability to build and transport basically whatever they wanted. And if that wouldn't strange enough, then you'll definitely be surprised to find that the loaded rail cars were almost never pulled. Rather, they were pushed. In the event of a radiation leak or derailment, the engineer could abandon his cargo and safely back the locomotive away, while also keeping a set of eyes on the problematic equipment the entire time. Pushing rail cars also meant the engine and its crew could never get caught between a rock and a hard place, should there be a mishap inside a building. Interestingly, the epicenter of this little railroad was an 84-foot turntable, which had room enough for the locomotive plus one flat car. Not only was this turntable used for switching tracks, it was also used to orient the locomotive such that it was always pushing its load. Knowing that this engine only hauled potentially hazardous nuclear equipment, its design makes much more sense. The cab, which could also be used to transport a small amount of people, is made mostly of lead, and some parts were filled with water. Both the front and rear windows come in at a whopping four feet thick. They're each made of two panes of lead glass with several gallons of oil in between them. Imagine trying to see anything out of that. Despite these windows being exceptionally large, they actually can be opened. Well, at least the rear one can. It's the emergency exit. The assembly is so heavy that it needs a steel I-beam and A-frame to support its weight. So with no doors and a window that really shouldn't be opened, it kind of seems like a mystery as to how anyone actually gets in this thing. But that's where the coolest design feature of all comes in. The floor hatch. During normal operation, all personnel would enter and exit through a hydraulically actuated hatch in the floor. To save people from having to belly crawl out from under this thing, it was parked over strategically placed radiation shielded tunnels around the complex. Once positioned over a tunnel, a telescopic tube would extend downwards from the locomotive's base, allowing for safe movement in and out of the vehicle by sealing out any radiation. Inside the cab, it's quite bland. The controls are as basic as they come. Heck, it looks like you don't even have a train brake. But you do have a secondary set of controls should things go real south. And a radio, which was your only form of communication with the outside world. In this engine's later years of operation, live cameras were mounted to the outside of it, so all movements could be monitored remotely. 
The copious amounts of lead, water, and oil it took to keep the crew protected meant this little 45-foot switcher weighed in at a whopping 215 tons. For reference, that's about the same weight as a modern road locomotive, which is well over twice this thing's size. All this baggage gave the engine a breakneck top speed of 4.5 miles an hour, unloaded. When it was laden with cargo, that top speed dropped to a thrilling 2.5 miles an hour. But it was for a good reason. Since the loaded rail cars this thing pushed were so heavy, there were fears that the rails would give out from underneath them. So maintaining a slow speed meant the train could always be stopped on a dime in the event of an accident. This unnamed beast served the Idaho National Laboratory day in and day out up until the 1980s. But as the Cold War came to a close, the U.S. government no longer needed to research nuclear technology as intensely. So it was decided to shut down most of the testing facility and tear up the unique four rail tracks. Today, next to nothing remains of the double wide roadbeds or turntables. The only artifacts we have from this bizarre railroad are two nuclear jet engines built atop double wide flat cars and the sole locomotive that kept the whole operation running. And if you want to, you can see this thing in person. Since 2006, it's been on public display at the EBR-1 Museum outside of Arco, Idaho, right in the backyard of the very test facility it once served. Thanks for watching. If y'all enjoyed this video, consider checking out some other ones of mine. Also, maybe pass yourself by the merch shop. Anyways, till next time.